give Nicole Brown a hand for being dynamic. <laughs> I am delighted to be here, Dr. Wells, Dr. Swafford, and all of you. I begin with poetry. William Carlos Williams once said that it's difficult to find news in poetry, and yet men and women die miserably every day because of a lack of what is found there. It was the, the late Maya Angelou who said to our country, lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands, mold it into the image of your most public self, sculpt it into the shape of your most private need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, good morning. And I say to you, good afternoon, Chattanooga. Good, good afternoon. Give my Angelou a hand for the words of poetry. I am delighted to be here. I was so impressed listening to all of you. But when, when Dr. Wofford was talking about the data-driven analysis and the high expectations and the rise in the scores and having villages raising children and talking about Chattanooga and the success you're having in helping brilliant young girls, I thought to myself, this is a wonderful national model. Give yourselves a hand for believing in your children. <laughs> I'm Bourbon, and I want you to hear me saying this, and I really mean this, that I am, I've already done my texting, and Dr. Wells and Dr. Wa uh, Wofford, Dr. Swafford, I have actually gotten permission. We're going to make sure that the videotape, that the White House sends it out around the country. Give yourselves a hand for getting distribution. Wanting people to know, this is way, uh, those of you business leaders will appreciate this. Uh, my line to young presidency is remember this, a day without an ask is a day without sunshine. You ask somebody for money every day. So I want to ask you right now, I'm going to say this, you are blessed to have this school. Give me a hand for the idea of giving funds to this school to give them support. I want to say that. I really do. And to get national model. And to hear about a church that has tutors coming in. Give that church a hand for what they do for giving. I really... I love that. And so I, I am from Baltimore. You know, we say that Baltimore is the upper south, the upper south. One day we think like people in Philadelphia. The next day we think like people in Richmond, all right? It depends on the issue. It's been that way since the Civil War. But I grew up in Birmingham. Now, Birmingham is the deep south. Emphasis on the adjective deep, all right? And I love my hometown. Uh, at UMBC in Baltimore, we have students from 150 countries, and it has been an amazing experience for me to work with other nations and looking at how we educate children around the world. But I grew up in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, and actually would come up to Chattanooga to look out in mountain, and I had a godmother up here, and, and would have a beautiful experience in your city. And so I have fun memories of Chattanooga. But I grew up to the students. Raise your hand if you are a student in the room. Let me see you. Give all the students a hand, would you please? Students, I had the privilege as a child when I was 12 of being in the back of the church, not wanting to be there in the middle of the week, minister, and my parents would bribe me with the two things I loved most, mathematics and food. So I'm sitting in the back of the church eating my M&Ms, the good kind with the peanuts. I'm getting fatter and smarter all the time. You know, they like those cheeks. You know what I'm talking about. And... I hear the man saying, if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that children want a good education. And I went home and I said, I want to go. I want to march because I want a better education. And my parents said, absolutely not. And I said to my parents, you guys are hypocrites. You tell me, you want me to go to church, listen to the guy. What was the guy's name, students? It was Dr. Martin King. And... Now you won't let me go. You're hypocrites. Now, at that time, students, you did not tell your parents they were hypocrites. They told me to go to, boy, go to your room. 
But the next morning they came in, they had prayed all night. They said, we just didn't know what would happen if you went. But if you want to go, you can. And so I did. I participated and did civil protest in the words of Thoreau, peaceful protest, and spent a week in jail, students, a week. And the experience taught me at age 12 that even children can be empowered to believe in themselves, to have a sense of self. I want you to give CGLA a hand for, be for believing in these children and teaching them to believe in themselves. <laughs> Very important. When, when Condorell spoke, when Anyang spoke, when Frida spoke, you could, first of all, they could read well. Give them a big hand for being able to read well. And secondly, they had dreams, as Maya Angelou talked about, of being an engineer, of being a financial analyst. It's amazing, of being a mathematician. And this is the message to this audience, the way we think about ourselves as a society, as human beings, the language that we use in interacting with each other, the way we treat our children, the values that we hold will be so powerful we become like whatever it is that we truly love. If we have faith in God, if we have faith in our children, that good spirit, that will, will come across the room and you say, we believe in these children, we believe in these young girls becoming young ladies. You know, I always tell the story of my mother who, as a little girl, had a choice. She was from not the big city. Birmingham, we call the big city, like Chattanooga. But she was from a little country town, Wetumpka, Alabama, outside of Montgomery. And mother said that when she was a child, students, she had a choice of either working in a hot cotton field after school or going to work in a wealthy home. And she said she wanted to see how rich people lived, rich white people. And she did, and the woman was very kind to her and would say, Maggie, when you finish your work, you can go into the library and read. Now, this was powerful because at that time, there was no library for children of color. And the only book in my mother's home, a wonderful book, was the Bible. And my mother said, the, the lady would say, well, okay, take the book home. When you finish, bring it back. All of a sudden, students, my mother's friends became very angry at her because they would say, Maggie, come on outside and play. And mom would say, no, I really want to keep reading my book. And they would say, this isn't school time. Why do you want to read that book? And she had to think about it. And this is what she realized, that there was a growing difference between herself and her girlfriends. And here was the difference. Mother said the more she read, the better a reader she became. And the more proficient a reader she became, the more she enjoyed the experience. And the more she enjoyed reading, the more reading she did. She said the problem with her girlfriends was that they never read enough to become good at it. And so it was a painful experience. And she'd see the girls reading a book and then pushing it away and saying, that's not interesting. Well, nothing is interesting if you don't do it well. And there was the dilemma, how to get children to read enough so that they became good at it and enjoyed the experience. And mother grew up, the valedictorian of a little country high school, went to college, and became an English teacher. And so all of my life, I heard my mother quoting from Shakespeare to Emily Dickinson to Zora Neale Hurston in her book, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And I get goosebumps now that my mother's no longer here. I can still hear her voice and my daddy smiling as we watched my mother washing dishes and making us clean up, but citing poetry and discussing prose, and ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing, until the watcher turns his head away in resignation. His dreams mock the death by time. That is the life of men, and my mother would say, and women. And the point of Hurston, Zora Neale Hurston, that wonderful Harlem Renaissance writer, was that you had these two groups of people. And in the words of Langston Hughes, while one group like us, the people in this room, could see dreams being fulfilled, the little girls, the young ladies here today, they're seeing their dreams and the dreams of their families fulfilled. They're going to a fine school where the scores are going up and they're on their way to becoming engineers and scientists and artists. 
And on the other hand, in the words of Langston Hughes, there are so many people whose dreams are forever deferred. The fundamental point my mother and father made to me, the point that this school is making to this community and to the children, is that the difference between those whose dreams are fulfilled and those whose dreams are deferred, fundamentally, is education. Students, if you ask any adult in this room, where would you be if you had not gotten an education? You will see the look on the faces of the adults thinking, I have no idea. Because we are who we are because of wonderful families. I, you've got a group here called, uh, I think, First is First. I mean, the idea of family, the importance of family, the idea of church, of faith, the idea of values, the idea of education. You know, after that march in Birmingham and the march in Washington and Selma and other places, all of a sudden, legislation, civil rights legislation, higher education legislation, voting rights education to help all Americans. I said this to a group of business leaders in Georgia, and a man got up and said, Freeman, I'd like to say something about what you just said. When people think about the 60s and they think about civil rights, maybe they think about people of color, maybe they think about women, but they don't think about all Americans. He said, people see me as the CEO of a company, and yeah, I'm a rich white guy. He said, but what they don't know is that my dad had died and my mother was a sharecropper. And yet she saw the little kids of color getting ready to go to college, and she said, I wanted my children to go to college too. And because, he said, I went and my sister went, we got good jobs after college, and we could move our mama out of sharecropping. And today we are an advantaged family. He said, so when you talk about that civil rights movement, whether you're in California or in, in Georgia, remember, this is an effort that helped so many Americans go to college. And so we should all celebrate what we as Americans did to help so many. Give that movement a hand, if you would, please. That we all... Now, here's my question. How long do you think anybody can speak, according to the neuroscientists, before you stop concentrating? What do you think? Somebody said 30 seconds. Oh, my Lord, you left me a long time ago there. Wait a minute. <laughs> Somebody else, how long? Seven minutes. Anybody else? It, officially, it's 20 minutes. Of course, now, I talked to a, a, a guy who's over the Brain Institute at a major university. He said, Freeman, we tell human beings 20 minutes to try to push them to think that long. Because the fact is, let me tell you, all of you are, the adults in the room are 20th century learners, and you're successful. So you know how to fake it. You look at me like you listen to me when I know you think about what you got to do when you leave here. I know that's right. I know you are, uh-huh, but you got, uh-huh, uh-huh, and thinking about what you got to do at home tonight. I know. And so the way you learn as a, in the teaching and learning process, my campus focuses on course redesign and flipping classrooms and not just lecturing because people can't listen but so long. If you get a chance, go to, go to the website of UMBC, and you'll see kids from 150 countries. You'll see something called course redesign, but you'll see we flipped a lot of classes. And then look at the 60 Minutes piece on the campus, and you'll see the idea is how do you excite students by getting them involved in the work. And so I have to ask you a couple of questions. How many of you in this room are between the ages of 35 and 70? I've got good news and bad. Which one you want first? Bad news is you're getting old. Get over it. It's okay. It's okay. I'm over 60, so I, I mean, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. It beats the alternative, right? All right? But the good news is if you are an American, you are the best educated in the world. Only Norway is slightly better educated. Now, how many of you are between 25 and 34? And look at how proud they are. They're going, I'm not old like that. Look at I see you look, uh-huh. I'm not like you old folks. Well, I got good news and bad. Which one you want first? Bad news is you're not as smart as we are. <laughs> <laughs> but the good news, we are so jealous. We wish we were your age. Right? <laughs> I'd be a little less smart if I could be just a little less young. Oh, wait. <laughs> but why do I say that jokingly? But why do I say that? I just told you that people over 35 are number two in the world. Your group, 25 to 35, you're number 12. Now, that's the reality. That, that just that many countries have gone ahead of us. And it's not because we have fewer people going to college. It's that they don't graduate. Half of the people who go to college don't graduate. So the challenge for CGLA and for everyone else is to help people go to college, but then to succeed. And, and here is the really the bottom line idea. What percent of Americans do you think in the 60s had a college degree in general? What do you think? I heard 
12, somebody? 10, anybody else? 30, anybody else? You know, you're a pretty risk adverse group. I can tell you, all used to getting the A by waiting until you know the answer before you say it that. <laughs> Give me some more guesses. 25. It was actually only 10% in mid-60s. Most people don't know that. But see, you didn't need a college education to have a good job. Most of you had parents. You could work in a, a Bethlehem Steel, a Stockham Valley and Fittings in Birmingham. You, there were places you could get a decent job and take care of your family, right? <coughs> Today, more and more, you need that education to make a difference. And more and more about STEM that I'll get to in just a minute. But here's my question. So let's break it down. At that time, we didn't have different racial groups. We talked about black and white in the 60s all over America. What percent of whites had a college degree? I heard 20, I heard 40, anybody else? It was only 11%. What percent of blacks? 2, 3%. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so most Americans did not have a college degree, almost 90%. What percent today have a college degree? I heard 45, anybody else? 30, anybody else? 50, it's actually 30%. See, you're not listening to it, but you're good. You already know the answers, all right? 30%, all right? Let's break it down. Now we break it down by different racial groups. What percent of whites have a college degree? Six, somebody that says 65. You think a lot of white people, don't you? Uh -huh, that's, that's a joke, folks. That's a joke. Wait a minute. <laughs> I love the way you turn red. That's the one advantage we have. We don't turn red, all right? <laughs> you got to put some humor into the stuff. But it's only, believe it or not, it's only 37% of whites. What percent of blacks? It's up to 19%. What's the fastest growing group in our country? Hispanic, what percent? It's only 15%. Native Americans below that. Now, what percent of Asian Americans? I, somebody said 100. It's not 100. <laughs> not 100, right, man? But it is 55%. Now, let me give you one more incident. I'm a, I, I spend a lot of time working with ministers of science in other countries. How many of you believe, listen very carefully now, this may upset you, hold your seats. How many of you believe that there are many more, much larger numbers of brilliant Chinese and Indian children than American children? Most people say, oh, you couldn't say that. Our kids are as smart as anybody else. Well, that's not a politically incorrect question. It's a mathematical question, folks. Right? There are 1.3 billion Chinese, 1.2 billion Indians. You put those two together, you have 2.5 billion people. Okay? Now, the top 10% of any population will be extraordinary. What is 10% of 2.5 billion? Do not let me leave Chattanooga, Mr. Superintendent, thinking y'all don't know any math, all right? What's 10% of 2.5 billion? 250 million. How many Americans are there in total? 310, 15, right? So look at this. The point is there are as many at the top extraordinary achievers from those two countries as we have citizens. So if you look at <clears throat> the computer science program on my campus <clears throat> at the PhD level or at MIT, 75, 80% of the students come from those two places. Now, here's the challenge that we face. We have the best higher education system in the world. And yet, what we know now is this. Thank you so much. What we know now is this. Many of the people who come here will go back to their countries. All of my Indian students can go back to Mumbai and work for IBM which is great for the company, but it's not taxes here in America. You get my point? So the challenge that we face is that while we bring a lot of people from other countries to help us, we are not going to have the workforce we need unless we look at what places like CGLA are doing to make sure that children who are here become well-educated. Give this school another round of applause for helping America. <laughs> for helping America. Now, here's my question. How many of you love to read in this room? Okay. All right. How many of you in this room, now I want the truthful answer now. I know you go to church. How many of you in this room love mathematics? Let me see your hands. It's a pretty nerdy group. You're about 25%. That's <laughs> now, let me tell you. This is what I want you to hear. So my own background is math. You heard me say that. But here's why I was so blessed. My mother was an English teacher at the, in the 60s, and all of a sudden, something came out called the new math. Anybody remember the new math? Mm-hmm. The reason the new math really didn't work is that we in universities thought we could just tell teachers what to do. What we didn't understand was teachers understand children. 
professors don't necessarily understand behavior issues. As, as, your, as the people here were saying, it's not just about the content, it's about the whole person. It's about being able to work with a child with hope and, and to get that child motivated and to deal with all the challenges the child brings from home. And so we went through set theory and all kinds of things, and we ended up with more Americans being afraid of math than ever. And here, here is the point. Only 5% of the degrees awarded to 25-year-olds in America are in STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. In Europe, it's 11%. In India, they are now creating 800 additional universities. Did you hear that? 800 additional universities, heavily science and tech. What is wonderful about your school is that you're taking the arts and humanities, blending it with science and engineering. And the point I would make, and this is what I learned from my mother. My mother decided to go back and become a math teacher because everybody was scared of the math. She said, I'll try it. And this is what she learned, folks, and I want the teachers in the room and others to hear me saying this. She came to understand that to teach a girl to solve word problems, you must know that that girl can read well. Because we do not discuss problems in engineering, in medicine, in numbers. We discuss it in words. Give me a hand for a good reading and thinking skills. Reading and thinking skills. And so I became her guinea pig. She was determined to immerse me in poetry, to have me reading short stories and novels, but also to begin to look at word problems. And I gave some of the kids in the room a problem I'm giving all of you. You didn't know you were getting a math problem. Let me see. How many of you like math? Let me see your hands. Okay. Before I give the problem, anybody willing, excuse me, minister, to bet me about whether you can solve This is a sixth grade math problem I'm about to give you. Because if you're going to talk about STEAM, you want to talk about the arts and humanities, but you want to talk about math. Because at the foundation of anything in genetics and chemistry and biochemistry and engineering will be mathematics. Okay? Here we go. Anybody want to bet me $1,000 before I start? Sixth grade math problem. Here we go. Now, I get goosebumps doing these math problems. 29 children are in a class. 20 have dogs. 15 have cats. How many have both? a dog, and a cat. I'll say it again. 29 kids in a class. 20 have dogs. 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? Now, how many people are willing to bet me $1,000 right now on the answer? Stand up. Let me see who you are. Y'all some risk-adverse people, I tell you. I want you all for the rest of the day in Chattanooga, Mr. Sum. if anybody wants to stand, let me see them now. If you don't, let me tell you this. Now, here is what is so interesting to the business community, to the teachers, to others. When you look at Singapore, when, you, when I look at math in other countries, when I look at the international math and science competition, what you find is that the problems that children in the best performing countries get are problems that can't be solved like this. Because in real life, adults in the room know you don't solve problems like that. That problems, whether it's about poverty or about challenges with crime or about problems involving international issues, require constant thinking and struggling and working with them, whether it's in the social sciences or it's in the arts and poetry. You know, I have been studying T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland for 35 years. And I go back to it all the time, and I'm, I'm stumped, and yet I get some insights, you know, and it's, it's like Beckett. On my campus, we, we, we do a lot in STEAM, involving the arts, in theater, in dance, and robots, and engineering, and movement. And it's amazing. Um, Beckett is our muse, the, the, the Irish novelist who wrote on Francais. And, and uh, he has a book in which the, uh, the, the character Malloy studies the dancing of bees. And the character says this. He's talking about how bees dance. He said, here is something I could study all my life and never understand. But the significance was that he said it with great rapture. He was fascinated because the more he studied the dancing of the bees, he began to, the more he understood how they communicated. But aha, the more he understood, the more he realized there was so much more to know. He got just a glimpse to begin to understand it. And that's what it means to become educated, whether in STEM or in literature, that the more we learn, the more we realize there's so much more to know. 
And when I think about problem solving, the sixth grade math problem that is from College Board, by the way, do not Google the problem. Do not Google the problem, because that'll give you the answer, okay? Students, what I want you to do is draw the problem. I have children at 12 years old and 9 years old, I'll have them act it out in theater. I'll have them with dogs and cats and little D's and C's, and they come up with lines 10 and 10 and 9, and then I have other people go around and look at it. I don't want you to use Venn diagrams. We in our country become too abstract in math. We should be able to see the connection between the math and people and children and dogs and cats. And what is my point? It is that any community that really wants to have its children excited about learning will focus on the reading and the thinking and the math and the science and the arts and will help people understand we don't, we don't categorize people. You know, when I was a kid, my mom and dad made me take classical piano, and somehow I thought, well, because I was a math kid, I shouldn't do music, but that's ridiculous. It was only after I was on the board of the conservatory at the Peabody that I realized I like this. I can love math and love music and see connections and patterns. And so the idea of connecting the arts and the humanities and ethics and languages, all significant. My campus does a lot with the National Security Agency. So students, I have young women at 17 and 18 who get security clearances, all right? And so I say I've got little spies all over campus. And they're doing linguistics and they're doing mathematics and they're protecting their country and it makes math rock. It's exciting in computer science. And here's my final point about STEM. Uh, if you don't know it, over the past 30 years, we have had a one-half drop, 50% drop in women majoring in computer science. We had gotten up to 36% in the 80s. We are down to 18%. So for women of all races, we need to be encouraging our girls to learn coding and to believe that technology is important because most of the jobs will require some kind of technology. And for those of you with parents who are parents, what we do is for my students in the humanities, for my students in the arts, we have them take a few technology courses and they can get great jobs, including in technology. Doesn't have to even be a major. It's connecting the areas. You know, at the end of my mother's life, she had developed dementia. You never want to see your mama going downhill, but my wife could tell she wasn't quite herself. And here was this brilliant woman who could, could quote Dickinson and say, tell the truth, but tell it slant. And we invited her to come up to Baltimore. And she stayed with us. And we we would learn things together. You know, my wife and I right now are studying French. How many of you in the room know French? I enjoy studying French. Some of the students, right? And so it's, I'm studying, and we're doing it because we're getting ready to have a big anniversary. And so my femme memoir, nous étudions le français, maintenant, parce que nous allons à Paris l'été prochain pour notre anniversaire de mariage pour 45. We're getting ready to have our 45th wedding anniversary. Give my wife a hand for that. 45th wedding anniversary. So we're on it. And students, I haven't studied French since high school, but I'm loving this experience because a lot of my students are French speakers on campus, so they're texting me on Francais all day. And what is amazing, I want to give you this one line as I close with my mama's story. It's from the poet Apollinaire, the French poet Apollinaire, who said, La joie venait toujours à play la pain. The joy comes after the struggle. Anything worth having requires hard work and discipline. My mama worked all her life to teach children, to excite them about literature, and then to excite them about word problems. And there she was at my house now, and she didn't even know who I was. And all of a sudden, I'm an only child. She looked at me and said, I know the end is near. You don't want to hear your mama say that. And I said, well, what's important to you? Because when somebody knows it's almost that time, you get the essence of the person. She said, what's important? She said, relationships. And this is my gift to the audience. She said, my relationship with my God. She could see I was about to cry. She was trying to keep me together. She said, hold on to your faith. You'll be okay. And then she said, my relationship with my husband. He's a wonderful man. She forgot my daddy had died 20 years before. And then she shocked me, students. She looked me right in my face. Now, I told you, and I'm only child. She said, I have a son. Oh, my goodness. I'm thinking she's about to tell me she had a kid when she's a teenager. <laughs> Going to drop that bomb in my lap and die. <laughs> and I'm thinking like my students, TMI, too much information. If I haven't had a brother at this point, I don't want a brother. Don't you drop this? I'm looking evil. And she smiles. She says, he's a college president. Thank God she was talking about me. She didn't know who I was. 
But then she gave me the gift I give to you, Chattanooga. She said, but you know, I now understand that teachers touch eternity through their students. Teachers touch eternity eternity through that. So whatever I had to give, my sense of right and wrong, my belief in my children, I gave it to them and I will always live through them. I went back to Birmingham and all these teachers got up and said, your mama didn't teach me to read. She taught me to love to read. And your mama came to the projects and told my grandmama, send your child to college. And my grandmama said, no, she's got to get married. Said, no, make her an independent, educated woman. Give me a hand for that. An independent, educated woman. And then all other things will come, the marriage and all of that. She said, and because your mama got me to college, I got my younger brothers and sisters, and we moved out of the projects, and it has been the story of our families. Chattanooga, I, I challenge you to remember this idea that the la joie venait toujours avait a plate of pain, that the joy comes after the struggle. We in America are struggling with the challenge of helping children who come from families where they've not had that, those books to help them to be able to become the engineers and the artists and the doctors and the scientists. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Dreams and values. Chattanooga, you are a special place and you can be even better. God bless you all. Le joie venait toujours à plein de pain. <laughs>